Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jane Booth. Hi, Jane. Tom, I'm so glad to be here. It's, it's great to be seeing you virtually. <laughs> Jane has been an active participant in the Kansas City art scene for a good number of years, as well as exhibiting her work throughout the Midwest and in California. Jane's paintings are in the public collections of institutions such as the Albrecht Kemper Museum in St. Joseph, Missouri, the Beach Museum of Art in Manhattan, Kansas, and the Hunter Museum of Art in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Jane wasn't always a painter, however. She studied ceramics at Kansas State University and even has experience as both a steel cutter and welder. All this before turning her attention to the canvas. She studied painting privately with Philomene Bennett, who herself is an icon of the Kansas City art community. Today, Jane and I will conduct you viewers through a virtual tour of her current exhibition at the Dom. And we'll be speaking about a number of the works in the show and some of the stories that lie behind the uh, paintings. The exhibition itself comprises 16 large scale compositions, primarily acrylic on canvas, and they date from 2017 until the very end of 2019 which today seems like it was just like years ago, but um, they're brand new. Um, Jane, many discussions of your work begin with a description of your fantastic studio and its setting in the rolling hills of Eastern Kansas and the influence of that locale on your work. Can you tell us a little bit about that and maybe describe your, your studio and its, its vistas? Yeah, my studio and home are located on a ridge that overlook a big valley. And it's just the air, the space, the visual space and the felt space and being surrounded by the natural world that is so nourishing to me. Uh, it always has been, I just kind of came in that way. And um, building the studio, I used to be working in my living room and then a bedroom with the walls pushed out. My work kept getting bigger and bigger and kind of taking over the house. So in 2014, I built a studio, which is really just a simple metal building, but it's very tall and uh, the lighting is beautiful. And uh, it also creates that, of course, space itself, but there's that, um, there's just, there's just voluminous air and out, out of every direction, there is nothing but wilderness. And it just, it makes my, it feeds me and it feeds my work. Mm -hmm. Well, a number of your works have uh, landscape feelings to them, if not actual elements. Is, is that something that you pick up on just by looking out the window and, and reflecting on, on what's all around you? I think it must uh, feed the work, but um, I don't ever consciously, none of my work is about ideas. I don't ever consciously think of painting what I'm seeing or painting how, even how something feels. It's more of being comfortable in this space and being tuned into the natural world, the migratory patterns, the wind, the huge wind today, <laughs> everything that's, that everything that's living here and and then painting in a a spontaneous or authentic way that is more instinctual than uh than idea based but oftentimes they end up the paintings end up to look like to be a bit journalistic to look like my surroundings or look like something that i've been through but if but it's not conscious it's just got to come through it's almost like you know, what's around you affects your psyche. And then that just needs to be an authentic work that comes from there. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that in addition to the landscape as a, a kind of a, maybe a muse is a good word for it, um, not an exact um, inspiration, but in addition to that, um, there are a couple of other main areas of inspiration. Uh, among those are, poetry and myth, 
and we've spoken together about your interest in the poets um, Rumi, the, the 13th century Persian mystic and poet, and Kabir, a 15th century Indian poet and mystic, um, as well as Sappho, the archaic Greek poet, Mm -hmm. and, um, and myths and legends, uh, there are references to Icarus and Sinbad in, in the uh, works in the, in the, in the exhibition. Yeah. If we go to the, the first slide, maybe we can um, start talking about how some of those ideas work their way into your compositions. Um, here we are looking into the first of the two rooms at the Dom. Um, and this is the Scott Gallery, but for the purposes of this exhibition, we've been calling it the Rumi Room. That was brilliant, Tom. Um, <laughs> not just for its alliterative appeal, but um, because there's poetry in all these works. Um, here we're having an overview of two of the paintings that we're gonna be speaking about. Let's go to the next slide. And here's another um, installation photograph of two more works in the Rumi Room. Um, and let's go to our third slide, and that will be that will begin our distinct discussion. This is a, a composition entitled "Island Journey, Day Three from 2019." Um, you've spoken about the origin of of this painting and the next painting as uh, coming from time that you spent on an island off the on the Gulf Shore of Southern Florida, and how you filtered your impressions of that landscape and a different landscape, also in, in light of the ecstatic poetry of Kabir and, and Rumi. Can you tell us a, a bit about this? Oh, maybe we need, need to go to the next photo too, just for a second. You sent me this one from your vacation travels and I thought this uh, captured interestingly the, the feeling of that island journey day two. Can you tell me the relationship between this painting or this uh, photograph, an actual photograph of the island area and the painting Island Journey Day 2, 3, sorry, 3. Let's go back to the painting. Yeah, so um, we rent a, a tiny cabin on a remote island in Florida, or we have for the last few years, and it's on stilts, and so I can set up a studio uh, underneath the house or fashion a studio and a good weather studio and um, it's very remote. We rarely see anyone else. And between the house and the ocean is simply beach and sea grasses. And um, there's this, so it's this, just this light blue sky and this deep blue ocean and the beach that stretches on as long as the island. And it's just, everything is pale and light and um, there is tons of life that is racing in front of you at all times. There's birds in the sky, there's the little shorebirds, uh, there's stuff that gets washed up from the sea, there's a relentless surf that is coming in at all times, there's the wind, um, an osprey lives on the roof who you can hear calling all the time and the life there is so different and the landscape is so different. And always my work is light that comes out of it. It always has that clear, clean background and spontaneous movement. And I can think of this as, it's actually called Island Journal. I painted three of them from that trip, one, or, one right after another. And it can almost be seen as a, as a, a snapshot if you just froze life right there for a moment. But the process of painting it is very much more alive and spontaneous. Um, and I love mark making. I love looking at handwriting and at graffiti. And uh, this piece is full of that. Very spontaneous, quick, straight from the hand to the canvas. Mm -hmm. Nothing percolated down through the head or through a notion or through a concept but just coming straight out. And uh, in a way it's conversational because one mark calls for another mark calls for another mark. Um, these were just kind of ecstatic to paint really. Um, 
with the eyes full of the beach. Well, I think that comes across. You know, one of the things I, I like about your work, and, and this is a, a kind of an exemplar of that, is, is they have this very public scale, they're, they're large scale works, but then the mark make, making really brings it back into the intimate. And um, I felt in a way that we were going through your journals, you know, you call this the island journal. And th there is that sense of that these are private notations and, and maybe things to remember later on, almost as if you're, you're giving yourself little memos and, um, and then combining them all in the composition. Uh, so that's very appreciated, that, that quickness of the, the calligraphy and, and the sketchiness of, of the various passages really communicates that, that idea of journaling, I think. Yeah. Um, let's move forward. We have that beach photo where, again, you can sense, you know, th there's the accumulation of, of objects and atmospheres. And, you know, that's why I love this photograph in relationship to that, that painting. But if we um, go forward to the next painting, this is um, a related work and it's entitled Sappho's Mountain Hyacinths, also from 2019. And um, it's interesting. I know that poetry plays a role in your practice, but maybe not in the way that I thought initially and maybe the way the viewers think. Um, I know that, that Sappho in her, um, in some of her collected fragments of poems, this one on love and desire has written like a hyacinth in the mountains that shepherds cr crush underfoot, even on the ground, a purple flower. Um, but that's not really the inspiration for this, is it? No, it was a look back as it often is. Um, this, this painting had two influences. It, it clearly came from the same time frame as the Island Journals did. So it was during or just after uh, spending that quiet uh, time in Florida. But also I had just seen Cy Twombly's retrospective in New York. Yeah, I don't know if I had just seen it, but anyway, it was still alive in me. And there was a painting, that show was so fantastic. And I don't know what it is about Twombly. I, I love his work beyond reason. And I know it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody, but I remember watching the elevator doors open when I was in New York in 1978 or nine or something. And there was a Twombly show at the Whitney and my heart just soared. I spent days in that, in that show. And when I returned, when I went back to New York, went to New York to see this show, it was the same way. And he had a painting there that referenced Sappho's mountain hyacinth. He was really big with Sappho and it was so beautiful. I can't even tell you what it was about that painting. It was very simple, just this smush of purple and some handwriting that just came drifting off of the canvas and it felt passionate and uh, of the moment. And so I researched it like crazy and then researched Sappho's poems and um, just climbed in really and immersed in that. So when this painting came out, it something about it felt like that. Maybe some tiny little portion of it. But um, so the title always comes after the painting is done and I'm looking at it to see what it is that it calls forth. And that memory certainly is indelibly burned into my soul. Mm -hmm. And Twomb Twombly is one of those other um, areas of inspiration for you, um, along with a number of other artists who I think we'll talk about when we get to the next room. Um, but it's good to keep him in mind. And we can certainly see that that calligraphy is um, an important, that type of callig calligraphy is important to you. Especially if we go to the next slide, this one um, more directly connected to poetry. Um, this is an installation shot that shows the, the multi-panel piece, uh, Kabir's Swans from 2018. Um, and you here you see it in the gallery. And then if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll get a closer view of it. Uh, th this set of, of nine uh, canvases is accompanied by a, a, another composition that where you have handwritten out a poem 
by Kabir. And um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read that through so that our audience can know what it, what it is um, you were thinking about. Mm -hmm. Swan, I'd like you to tell me your whole story, when you first appeared and what dark sand you were going toward and where you sleep at night and what you are looking for. It's morning, Swan, wake up, climb in the air, follow me. I know of a country that spiritual flatness does not control, nor constant depression, and those alive are not afraid to die. There, wildflowers come up through the leafy floor, and the fragrance of I am she floats on the wind. There, the bee of the heart stays deep inside the flower and cares for no other thing. Oh. As we look at this closely, we can see that um, in addition to the gestural and, and abstract mark making that's going on, you've also written over the various panels the poem. You've written out the poem. Some panels only have a word or two. Uh, the, the eighth panel has a, a much larger bit of text. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was saying to you before, I love the way that the, the calligraphic element of the written word um, harmonizes and it expands the, your gestural abstract mark making. Can you tell us about how, how that poem and this work came together? Well, thanks for reading it. Um, that brings it back to me. Um, so this painting is different from all of the rest because that poem was in mind and it was just a raw exercise of uh, canvases pinned up on the wall and I'd been, I'd been reading that poem and Kabir, the thing I love about Kabir is he is always just saying, you know, right now, um, what, what are you sleeping? What are you waiting for? Join God, wake up, you know, come out to the street. And it's always, it's, it's, it's so immediate. And, um, you know, for me, it's a universal message of, uh, don't don't make those plans. Just start now. Open up, and uh, the spiritual flatness that he references, the poem just deeply affected me. And uh, so it was really, um, it kind of came out very very spontaneously. I don't think I even looked back to adjust it, which almost never happens. Um, yeah, I just did it for me and. Uh, someone suggested that I stretch them. So I thought it ended up to carry some of that, mm -hmm. to carry some of that message. And then thinking back to the, the side Twombly untitled to Sappho, it has a, a, some of that quality of where he just took a, a, a passage of paint and then used his hand to dis describe the poem. Yeah, right. Well, the handwriting is so much, handwriting, is mark making and um, we're kind of losing that. We hardly make our own notes anymore, but I really love handwriting that's just scattered off somewhere or, um, you know, compositionally, we, we play with it a little bit, I think when we're writing. So anyway, it was all, it was all the, of the same piece in this, in this painting, the visual and the words. If we move on to another painting in this gallery, the um, music of the inner universe, and here we see it installed. Um, you didn't in initially intend it to be on two different walls. It, it's a, a diptych. Um, right. And if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll see it um, more clearly related. Here we have it. And the music of the inner universe is a, is, comes from a line in another poem by Kabir. Um, Listen, friend, this body is his dulcimer. He draws the strings tight, and out of it comes the music of the inner universe. If the string breaks and the bridge falls, then this dulcimer of dust goes back to dust. Take your seat on the thousand petals of the lotus, and there gaze on the infinite beauty. I that, love reading these, Tom. <laughs> that, the poem came second for you in this case, didn't it? You did. talked about having a, a very smooth experience painting this, this work, um, an unusual experience, I think. Yeah. It was it, it, extremely unusual. Um, this process, that painting came out 
all almost all in one piece. I think all, all in one piece, except for the next day when I think that black was pushed back a little bit with the white marks, but um, it just, how does that happen? In the first place, it's, isn't it 25 feet wide? And so I can't even see the whole thing at one time. Of course, there's this back and forth uh, that you do, but as I remember, it was just, it just kind of came pouring out. It wasn't split when I painted it. It was uh, all on one canvas. Uh, but I thought that the split helped it. But anyway, so um, it's just very airy. There isn't any heavy heaviness to it. There isn't any, there isn't really anything holding it to the ground. And a, three or four more marks and it would have become something else entirely. Um, so when I stared at it for days afterwards, because it seemed so spare and surely there was something else to do, but there just wasn't anything else to do. And so then I turned back, this was just this huge Kabir period of time, but I would rifle through Kabir looking for titles, which is really how I got more deeply involved with it. So I was looking for a title that felt like this and the music of the inner universe, that poem he's talking about this dulcimer is like this body and the universe comes through it. It's something that I know artists of all kinds talk about that it's hard to talk about, but it's there's more of a getting out of the way and then getting out of the way, I think of your head and then just allowing this, this body, this dulcimer tighten the strings and play. And then when the strings loosen or break and the dulcimer falls apart, you know, you drop to ashes yourself and you're done. And uh, so it just seemed, it seemed like a great title for the poem. It was a title for the painting. It was like the painting evoked the poem and the poem evoked the painting. It was really wonderful to paint that, that piece. What, what does splitting a composition into two panels do, do you think? What, what is the um, outcome of that? I just have never done that before with a with a mild with a mild painting like that. I have with an intensely marked painting because sometimes if you separate it, it allows you to see uh, detail. But in this one, it felt like these were these two distinct phases. Um, like this was one moment. Uh, I'm pointing, at, you know, I'm pointing at my computer screen. The one on the left is was was one moment, and the one on the right was the next. And it was just more pleasing. I, I put a barrier up on that in the studio and stared at it for a long time. It's scary to split it, but uh, it worked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's as if the work is having an internal converse, conversation, I think. It is. Between two, two aspects. Well, that is the roomy room. Let's <laughs> move on to the, the large room in the Freed Gallery. And here we have a, an overview of the Freed Gallery and we're looking south from the previous room that we were in. And we'll be talking about a number of these paintings. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> here we are looking north in the Freed Gallery. And I hope people are noticing something in the middle of the floor. Um, if we go to the next slide, I think that comes into greater focus. Uh, Oops, there's one more. And then there is the, at, we're, and we're looking at the piece on the floor now, which is entitled Instinct. Here you get a sense of, of it. It's a large scale piece, as you can see, it's 25 feet long and seven feet across roughly. Um, and let's go to the next slide and that will give us up. And here it is, this is the way I saw it originally. Um, this talks about how big your studio is. This was pinned up on the wall 25 feet long, pinned up on the wall with two, with two partners. It was a triptych. Um, th there was this painting, Instinct, then there was Instinct Transcendent, and the third, Instinct Embodiment. Um, I, how do you feel about having this separated from the other two? How does that work for you? Well, as it worked out, I think it's the only one that we brought. Someday I'd love to see it hang the, the three 25 footers all together because of sort of the story that they tell. But this is the one that 
it, there was a series called Instinct, and, and it, which is the title of the show and is the, the thing that is maybe the best description of what I try to talk about with the work. It's, it's working instinctively. It's working from not just like wild frenzy, um, uh, it, not just like senseless frenzy, but it's more of something innate that is a wisdom that can operate like a, you know, like, a, like animals do. They don't have language or like a coyote is moving. They're not planning to get up and get three rabbits for their two hungry children, but they get up and move in this way. And, and it makes sense. And, uh, life is sustained that way and it's a deep wisdom is the way I see instinct and so you know not not to call any attention to my instinct but it's just our instinct as as living beings and um these three pieces were they they described distinct um phases of what the first one was transcendence and the second one was Oh God, I can't think of the name of it. Emb embodiment. Embodiment. And then the third one is the manifest, which is, it's just a universal term across all spiritual uh, practices. And the manifest is when you go out into the world and use what has happened to you. And so this is the grounding piece. And for you to choose it, um, and then for you guys to have the idea to stretch it out on the floor was brilliant because when it's 25 feet high, you can't see the top of it. Um, I should show them with binoculars or something, but on the floor, you can walk up and down and you can see every mark and have an experience like walking along a river or something mm -hmm. and having it in the center of the gallery. You know, your vision was so beautiful to just have the paintings and have space. Um, but like we talked about, that space is so big to have this this river of brown running along the center of it was just brilliant. I just loved what you did with it. It, it held up fine by itself. Well, I love the way it looks as well. And you know, I think that I had recently been to, been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and um, visited their new Islamic arts wing. And they have a number of gigantic carpets that they've installed in, in their installation. Um, and set out on the floor as they would be, you know, raised, but set out as they would be originally. And so this was reminding me of that tradition of, of the Persian garden carpets, uh, the garden of paradise idea. And um, these were carpets that, that were meant to mimic these beautiful walled gardens that the, the rich Persians were able to construct for themselves and meant to look like the garden of paradise um, in heaven. Um, and they included flora and exotic flora and fauna and water features. And, and to me, walking around this is, has that same idea that there are um, objects interacting. There's a sense of nature, I think, embedded in it. Mm -hmm. and it just holds that room, I think. It really, uh, it really fills the room. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to our next. Um, here we have an installation view of the, the next two works we're going to talk about. And, and that's me talking to our uh, members of our docent corps back in January, just before the exhibition opened. Um, and we're going to be talking about After Dark in Spirit, which is on top, and After Dark in Body, which is on bottom. Let's go to the next slide. And here it is, After Dark in Spirit. And you've also um, pointed out some unique aspects of this painting in your, in your um, career. Um, yeah, the thing I, the, the, the fact about the studio and the space I, um, that you were asking about when we began, one thing that has happened dramatically when I built the studio after having worked in these shelled out parts of <laughs> buildings, um, is the space is so big that I began to paint bigger and bigger and bigger. And this work does not look that big in the studio, nor does it in the museum. But these are sort of almost like smaller pieces and they're 12 feet wide 
Mm -hmm. I think they're six feet tall. They might be a little shorter than that. Yeah. So anyway, this was meant to be a diptych. I had mixed up a bunch of old paints and uh, spilled a huge amount of this. I had about four gallons of it and I spilled a huge amount of it on the studio floor, had these two canvases out. So I picked up, I used warehouse brooms for, um, for some of these larger pieces. And you can see that mark making in this one. It just came, it was very spontaneous and uh, there was an eye on the hole. I was working on the floor so I could really kind of see all of it and what was happening. There's various points of wetness and dryness on the canvas that caused the, the paint to scatter a little bit or to hold uh, or to hold a sharp line. And um, this one was really fluid and you can see there's no marks. There were a few dripped red paint uh, after the fact of, of using this broom, but it was really, there's just no mark making on it at all. It's all color field. It's an active color field, but it's color field. But then the second one. Uh, let's go to that next slide, yes. Um, the second one was done, you can see the broom. Um, <laughs> did I just freeze for you? Oh. Anyway, um, the the broom marks were still here, but I tacked this one up on the wall and began to uh, to put these these marks. It's, it's kind of like the human experience is here, and the one prior is called After Dark in Spirit, and this one is called After Dark in Body. This one is more carnal and um, busy and anguished and fraught with things and joyful and it just has uh it has more uh it's got more human it's got more body in it and uh, so and i came upon those titles of course after the fact too but the the prior one we could take a quick glimpse at it let's go back one can we go back to the previous slide Thank there you. it is you can see how they feel so different and when uh, Tom, when you when you curated this show, you weren't sure exactly how you were going to place these until the work was delivered, and then you had that insight to place this one. Uh, the, the two of them stacked on a wall, and so the in spirit is above, and the in body is below, and they just they speak to each other. I'd hung them next to each other before, but having one on top of the other made them feel richer and more whole. Let's go back one more slide to that installation of the two of them. Um, you know, Jane, this is something else, another influence that um, I wanted to discuss. Some of the artists that have been important to you and Cy Twombly certainly is right up there. But um, from my point of view and because of the collection at the Dom, um, color field painters who you just mentioned, people like Helen Frankenthaler are certainly um, important to the Dom. We have some very um, important paintings by her. Um, and then the idea that you're working on the floor with the broom, with the soak stain, um, there, there seemed to be a direct um, ancestral link between you and, and work of, of some of the color field people. Well, I, I love Helen Frankenthaler and I have studied her greatly and she was a prominent feature in the Ninth Street Women. I don't know how many of you have read that book, but it's a tremendous book about uh, the abstract expressionists. But to tell you the truth, the, the color field actually originated because I was in a hurry to get going and to gesso the canvas to me is, um, just mind numbing. And um, I was in this workshop with Philomene Bennett, who uh, was so important to me those years ago. And I just put plastic down on the floor and I had leftover paints and that first raw, and I had the raw canvas, I poured some different things that were sort of left over into it and was just fascinated by what happened when one color met another or when part of the canvas was dry and part of the canvas was wet. And uh, so I painted that way for a little while. I didn't want to look at Frankenthaler's work because I knew about her, but I just wanted to see what this was like without having an idea or an image of someone else's that was in the forefront. And, uh, but then, you know, of course, since then I've turned to her work and love it and appreciate it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, let's keep moving through the gallery. If we go ahead a couple of slides to the, and there we are. Here's another um, installation shot. And this time we're focused on by the light of the moon, uh, which is that blue painting in front of the docents. And let's go one more slide. And there we have a good image of it. Um, once again, at the, uh, a poem helped with the title. And because I'm liking reading all this poetry today, I'll... <laughs> Great. This one, um, Edward Lear, and it's from his poem, The Owl and the Pussycat, which I think many of us might know. Um, in particular, and hand in hand on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. But again, that came afterwards. It did. It did, but it was, it was, uh, the, it, the painting feels like that part of the poem, that last little piece, there was a rinsable spoon. Anyway, mm -hmm. that last little piece of that poem is just so, um, you know, they're just disappearing in that moonlight. And this painting was really different. And I, it actually, I don't paint often with uh, these deep blue backgrounds, but this gorgeous turquoise that came out of mixing paint uh, laid onto raw canvas, which was laid out on concrete, which I think had something to do with it. There was a little bit of graphite in it. And this, these, the way the pigments hit on that concrete, the pigments scattered. And you can see in the background of the painting, those little, it's like underwater, mm -hmm. there's just movement, there's little shooting stars, or there's all that activity. And it was so it was so fascinating to me, just as it was, that I pinned it up on the studio wall. I just couldn't make a mark on it. I mean, how could it be better than that? But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't quite right to stretch and hang. So I just gradually tiptoed into this painting and put some of these sort of cloudy marks, stared at it again, a few more marks, stared at it again. I spent way more time looking at this painting than I did painting this painting. And in mm -hmm. fact, I think it was two or three years after the initial wash went down that it was actually done. It was like one last frenetic afternoon and, uh, and it was done. Jane, can you check your camera? You seem to have disappeared. Yeah, I know. I froze and then I froze and then it disappeared and turned into my, there, now I just, yeah, it's something with the computer. Yeah. All right, well, we'll... Hide non-video, hide self-view. Sorry about that. Um, the other, th I, I like that you talk about the length of time you take with a piece um, in the process and afterwards. Um, it, let's go to the next slide. And here we have an installation photo looking down, looking back at Because the Sun Shines. And let's go one more and we'll get a better view of it. This is from 2018. You spoke about atmospheres in some of your writings. And so I have two questions for you on this one. I understand this one took you a very long time to complete. And also, what do you mean by atmospheres when in, just in talking about your paintings? Well, this... Uh... Gosh, this, it's interesting for me. I, I, I wonder, I think it's probably like this for most artists, but to look at a painting can bring back, you know, it can bring back what was happening when it was painted and what time of year and what it smelled like. And um, this painting is really visceral for me. It was done in February and my big voluminous studio catches that north wind. It's really cold in the winter. And so I'm always bundled up and uh, fighting the cold a little bit. So the, oh, I'm getting to the answer to your question. So the color, the atmosphere began as these rich yellows and oranges, I think to just create some warmth really. Mm -hmm. um, it often happens in the teeth of winter that these really yellow ones come forth. So the atmosphere to me is like, oh, so to put it in a literal landscape, say that you're looking across a valley and it's the color, it's the gloaming, it's that soft blue, it's 
it's the color that everything is living in. It's the the rain or the bright or or um, and it that's it gives it its air. It's what it's where it kind of lives. And then the marks are what are animated. What the life is that is within that scene. And this piece, um, those warm colors, I don't even know how to, I've tried to do that again. Sometimes they just come together. But those really rich warm colors were pretty captivating and it was scary to make any more marks on it. Uh, so yeah, it started with that bow tie, that gray bow tie. Mm -hmm. And once that happened, of course, just the idyllic uh, <laughs> golden field was destroyed. So I had a little freedom to go back in. And mark and mark on it some more, make make more marks and more washes. Um, it still didn't feel quite right. And this is a great painting to look at for sort of push pull in space. So I keep talking about space, but you can look at that yellow and see that's just the very furthest away thing, the yellow, mm -hmm. and even the yellow at the bottom, the deeper yellow seems. Uh, what I can't think of the name of that color. It seems to come even a little bit closer. And then each mark that you make, it, it lands somewhere in space. So that bow tie, when it was the only thing, it was just right in the very front. You make a mark on top of that bow tie and the bow tie pushes back a little bit and the mark that you make is in front. So in a way to paint is this push pull in space of placing things in depth, in a certain amount of depth. And I think it was almost done, but it didn't quite have the life that I wanted it to have. And the last mark, maybe a year later, was that gold spray paint that's up in the middle high left, mm -hmm. middle left. Anyway, so I don't know if you can imagine what it looked like without that. For some reason, that one mark made the whole thing, uh, it just made it a little more cohesive. So yeah, that one took a long time. <laughs> uh -huh. Cohesive, but and also adding something very different to it because the spray paint certainly has a different texture, um, hand feel. It totally does. It's such a weird mark, and it's metallic. It's a gold metallic mark. But it does. It adds. It's the perfect fillip for the. Like a little bean. Yes. <laughs> Um, we have a couple more to look at. Let's go to our next installation. Here, we're, again, we're looking south and we're going to be speaking about the painting that's in the middle of those three on the wall. Um, and one more installation. And here we have um, one of your most recent paintings, at least in terms of this show, um, Palimpsest, uh, Lucid Dreams from 2019. If we go one more, I think we'll, we'll see it all by itself. There we are. Yeah, okay, well, that was a whole new direction. And uh, that I just wanted to use up some student canvases. And um, what a lucky thing. I pulled out some old canvases that I wasn't, that were never going to be resolved and stretched them and put uh, just like oops house paint on it. So everything was sort of free. Um, the, the house paint I slathered on it and left pieces of it that showed through from the old canvas, which is hence the name palimpsest, which is means, you know, partially covered or history showing through something along those lines. And a friend had given me a case of uh, this graphite paint, spray paint. And so everything was free. So I went to the studio and just began to uh, paint with total abandon, uh, with no care, no stops, no, um, just no hesitation. And they were very, they're very, they, they all came across as very sort of childlike and confident. Um, I never had the idea that they, that I would show them, but of course that's when the best work is done when you're just in discovery play mode. Those, um, those marks that, those graphite marks, those black, curly marks were inspired by um, a painter that I've been really interested in or was really interested in for a while, Albert Olin. He's a German painter and I was looking into his, um, looking into his work and was looking for exhibitions and where he was showing and he had a show in England, a huge show in England. And it was all based on 
the influence of this guy named John Graham, who was a philosopher in New York, moved to New York, he was a wild man, um, had been in the military and did cartwheels on his horse when he was riding into battle. Anyway, he was just crazy character. And he painted fairly poorly, um, but he was marvelously philosophical and, and wrote a manifesto for the artists of that time as, as image was beginning to break up and move into abstraction. So Olin got fascinated with Graham. So I started looking at Graham's work. And so these marks, if you ever look at that show, you will see they're straight from uh, that influence as well. It was a great ride though, because I got to read the philosophy of Graham and um, what he thought about the abstract expressionists. And so anyway, this that's a big story, but this series is probably about, there's probably eight paintings in them and they were, hot off the press, right, Tom, when you picked them? <laughs> yeah, for, um, for listeners or, or watchers of the program, you might want to look up John Graham's, his, his composition called Terrifying Sunset, which has the feel of this painting and as well as the next one. Let's go to that last, that last slide. This is Little Violet. Um, that openness and the, uh, the kind of surreal uh, um, accumulation of abstract imagery but imagery it's abstract and yet it's it's um it, it's a little more um it's a little more anecdotal maybe maybe than you often are it really is that's just a painting all of its own um yeah i'm just kind of taking it in as i'm looking at it those comb forms or those and then the uh, the curly Q lines, and he has that that handlebar mustache in his That's it. painting, a terrifying sunset. You found the one. That. I love that you've taken off from that. Yeah, those are the those are the first marks, and the rest of them come in later. But it's it's really different. It's more of a design and childlike and and uh, sort and, of and maybe a decorative yeah. quality that um, that you avoid and and some of the other work. That's right, exactly. <laughs> the other thing I like about, I, I have noticed about these two paintings, you know, you typically paint on unsized canvas. Um, and in these two, because you're painting on top of older works, the, the, um, the older work acts almost as a gesso. Um, and, and so the way that light interacts with these compositions is very different from the way they do on the, the way light interacts with the unsized canvases where there's an absorption that goes on and here there's a bouncing of light. Um, did, that's is that something you think about or is that just a, just what happened? No, I love that observation. It, it, uh, it was so completely different to work with it because it stands on top of the canvas and those pure color fields are completely matte. They are just mm -hmm. absolutely flat. And these have more texture and, um, you know, it was just any time that I switch things up like this and then there's just different problems to solve that puts me into a sort of a discovery mode where I don't really know what I'm doing outside of my normal patterns. That's a really, really good place for me to be. That's what these were for me. Just a completely different way of working. This was well, all brush work. Since these are the last two works before the pandemic, how, how have things gone forward? Well, things sort of screeched to a halt for a while. I was sort of frozen in my tracks and uh, I'm back in the studio now and got back in the studio over the summer productively. I haven't ever quit working in terms of sketching or small works, but um, yeah, it's, I'm in another mode of discovery. So uh, it's fun to play with, I'm in a good spot. Um, Jane, we have a, a question from one of our audience members. Um, and the question is, how do you feel about um, music of the inner universe being on two walls? That was, I thought it was quite graceful. Um, we had talked, you and I had talked about stretching it across. I don't know, that was a different idea. No, I just really, I really liked it. They still felt of a piece. And mm -hmm. when the way that those walls are angled you know, they're not 90 degree, but much wider than that. Yes. Um, it felt a little encompassing. So you could stand between those two walls and take it all in. 
I really loved it. Yeah, yeah, I thought it worked. I, I, and I've done that before with other, with other things that could also just go on, on a wall quite near each other. But because the, the angle is more oblique, it, it, it reads in a way almost as a, a single space. It does. Jane, we've done it. <laughs> You've disappeared, but I know you're there. <laughs> this is our, our first virtual, this is the Dom's first virtual conversation. Um, we're learning as we go along. And I hope that the audience has, has gotten as, as much enjoyment out of our conversation as I have. And I hope it's been meaningful for you as well. Uh, Tom, it's been so fun to talk to you all along the way. And I just can't tell you, I'm just, I've told you over and over the way that you've curated the show. It was, it's just, is the work is, is, is showing as well as it possibly could. It's just been a real joy. I've loved all of our conversations along the way. Great. And we're, we're very thankful that, of, of your willingness to share it with us and especially to share it with us up over such an extended period. It's, um, been a long weird year. And you know, we we were closed between March and August, but um, we, we went into the museum, we took turns going into the museum daily to make sure everything was all right with our physical plant. And I can't tell you, I, I never grew tired of walking through your two galleries and, and seeing the work by myself usually, um, sometimes not with the lights on, just with the ambient light mm -hmm. and it's held up month after month after month. So that's a, I think that's my test for uh, the significance of artworks. How they, how does it hold up over time? Oh, that's wonderful. I love to think about that. Yeah. Jane, thank you so much. And I'll look forward to seeing you before too long. All right, thank you, Tom. Thank and you so much. Thanks everyone for joining us today. <laughs>